Okay, continuing in part two of the analysis of section 132, continuing again in uh, section 132, verse 64. And, uh, and again, verily, verily, I say unto you, if any man have a wife who holds the keys of this power and he teaches unto her the law of my priesthood as pertaining to these things, then she shall believe and administer unto him or she shall be destroyed, saith the Lord your God. For I will destroy her, for I will magnify my name upon all those who receive and abide in my law. Therefore it shall be lawful in me if she receive not this law, for him to receive all things whatsoever I, the Lord his God, will give unto him, because she did not believe and administer unto him according to my word. And she then becomes the transgressor, and he is exempt from the law of Sarah, who administered unto Abraham according to the law when I commanded Abraham to take Hagar to wife. And now as pertaining to this law, verily, verily, I say unto you, I will reveal more unto you hereafter. Therefore let this suffice for the present. Behold, I am Alpha and Omega. Amen. Uh, this is the Watcher replying in red. Okay, before I wrap things up here, I want to go back to the beginning of verse in section 132 and go into a little more detail. What I have to say about it needed to be at the end of this article, not at the beginning. Please forgive the repetition of the few things I have previously stated. Please keep reading. There's information you need to read. Okay, in section 132 verse 1. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you, my servant Joseph, that inasmuch as you have inquired of my hand to know and understand wherein I, the Lord, justify my servants, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, as also Moses, David, and Solomon, my servants, as touching the principle and doctrine of their having many wives and concubines. Okay, this is a watcher replying in red. Verse 1 is a big, big red flag in my opinion. It would have us believe that the revelation came as a result of Joseph Smith asking, or Joseph Smith asking on behalf of one of the elders of Israel, the Lord to explain why he had justified, among others, David and Solomon, in having multiple wives. The Book of Mormon uh, had already revealed that David and Solomon were not justified in having many wives and concubines. Did Joseph Smith believe the Book of Mormon that he had brought forth by the gift and power of God? Of course he did. Why would Joseph Smith, as the seer of the Lord who translated the Book of Mormon, be asking why God justified David and Solomon in taking multiple wives, when in fact it was through his efforts in translating the Book of Mormon that he was able to reveal to the world that David and Solomon were not justified in having multiple wives? Quote, For behold, thus saith the Lord, that this people begin to wax in iniquity, they understand not the scriptures, for they seek to excuse themselves in committing whoredoms, because of the things which were written concerning David and Solomon his son. Behold, David and Solomon truly had many wives and concubines, which thing was abominable before me, saith the Lord. End of quote. Not only does the Book of Mormon clarify that David and Solomon were not justified, it declares that what they did was an abomination. It reveals that those who used the scriptures to justify their actions in practicing polygamy did not understand the scriptures. It's almost inconceivable that the Lord's anointed would ask such an unsound question of the Lord when he had already been an instrument in the hands of God to shed light on this issue. If the question would have been limited to asking why Abraham and Jacob and the righteous patriarchs that lived the principle were justified, there would have been no inconsistency, and it would have been a sound and valid question. It may seem a little odd that the Lord would play along as if the question was a valid one. There is actually a biblical principle that's invoked here, having to do with asking idolatrous questions to the Lord. We'll cover that in a minute. However, we need to remember that God had warned the saints in the original version of what is now known as Section 5, that he would deliver them up into Satan if they hardened their hearts against his word. It is not hardening our hearts against his word in the Book of Mormon if we reject what it teaches about David and Solomon. In teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, we're informed 
that Joseph Smith taught the Relief Society that the church was in a state of darkness because they were blindly following the prophet instead of being responsible for their own salvation. Quote, President Joseph Smith read the 14th chapter of Ezekiel, said the Lord had declared by the prophet that the people should each one stand for himself and depend on no man or men in that state of the corruption of the Jewish church, that righteous persons could only deliver their own souls, applied it to the present state of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, said if the people departed from the Lord, they must fall, that they were depending on the prophet, hence were darkened in their minds. That's in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith. This is an incredibly insightful and ominous declaration made by the prophet Joseph Smith. He's telling the Relief Society that the current state of the restored church in Nauvoo in 1842 is in the same condition as the corrupt Jewish church. What an appropriate time for the spiritual wife doctrine to raise its ugly head. It seems to me he's telling them that they are in a state of darkness because they are blindly following him instead of searching the scriptures for themselves and taking the Holy Spirit as their guide. Putting this declaration from the Prophet Joseph Smith in historical context, uh, bullet point, it is after the church rejected the full implications and greater light that was offered them at the special conference of the Morley Farm in 1831. Next point, it was after the failure of the saints to redeem Zion in 1836. Next point, it's after the defiling of the Kirtland Temple. Next point, it's after the declaration of the Lord in section 112 that all flesh has become corrupt. Next point, it's after section 124 and 1841 when the Lord revealed that the fullness of the priesthood had been lost and that the saints were currently practicing abominations before him. And last point, and it was after he had declared that baptisms for the dead were no longer allowed in the river, indicating, according to Lyman White, that the sufficient time to complete the temple had lapsed, causing the Lord to reject the church with their dead. I guess the state of the church was pretty grim at that time. To think that the Lord is now going to reveal some glorious higher law, when the saints had rejected the last higher law, as contained in section 42, is ludicrous, especially since the new higher law contradicted the last higher law. And if we believe the research that has been done by those who have studied Joseph Smith's involvement in polygamy in Nauvoo, he was allegedly taking some of the married Relief Society women in the audience as wives yet he was chastising them for blindly following his teachings. But most people miss the rest of the story by only noting the summary of Joseph's remarks that he made to the ladies. The deeper story is found in analyzing the biblical text upon which he built his sermon to them. Have you ever studied Ezekiel 14? Note the first four verses. I hope you're sitting down because your paradigm about how God responds to his apostate people may be challenged a little. Quote, then came certain of the elders of Israel unto me, and sat before me, and the Lord, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their heart, and put the stumbling block of their iniquity before their face. Should I be inquired of all by them? Therefore speak unto them, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, Every man of the house of Israel that setteth up his idols in his heart, and putteth a stumbling block of his iniquity before his face, and cometh to the prophet. I, the Lord, will answer him that cometh according to the multitude of his idols, that I may take the house of Israel in their own heart, because they are all estranged from me through their idols. End of quote. When an elder of Israel inquires of God with a pure heart, he will get a pure answer from the Lord, usually through his anointed servant, if an elder inquires of the Lord based on the idolatry of his heart, his answer that he gets will be based on that idolatrous spirit that is in him. It is possible that Joseph Smith may very possibly have been originally inquiring in behalf of another elder of Israel rather than directly for himself. But at this point, it doesn't really matter because I want to stay on topic and even if Joseph was asking on behalf of himself, it's all covered by the Atonement Statute and Associated Scapegoat Doctrine anyway. We know that the sins of Israel were artificially placed upon Joseph, Sidney, and others at some point in time, and they acted them out. 
The point is that section 132 begins with an unsound inquiry. It is initiated by an idolatrous question, one that appears to have been based on the idolatry in a person's heart. If those inquiring had believed that what the Lord had taught about David and Solomon in the Book of Mormon, the inquiry would never have been made because they would have known that David and Solomon were not justified. Hence, the first of this revelation is extremely problematic. According to Ezekiel 14, the Lord may mirror the response based on the idolatry that's in the heart of the person inquiring. Sometime we'll do a much more in-depth analysis of Ezekiel 14 to show that the message gets much deeper. It addresses the scapegoat doctrine, and it is actually a prophecy of the very event we are discussing, but it covers it at a deeper level that I don't want to get into right now. Nevertheless, it's referring to a very specific event that was to take place in the last days. After teaching us that God can send a strong delusion upon an apostate people, see also Second Thessalonians, based on the idolatry of their hearts in Ezekiel 14, the Lord continues to build upon that doctrine in chapter 20. He explains that when a people fail to exercise his true judgments and statutes, such as failing to live the true law of the gospel, which includes consecration and monogamy, he will then give them false judgments and statutes. Quote, because they had not executed my judgments, but had despised my statutes, and, and had polluted my Sabbaths, and their eyes were after their father's idols, wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live, and I polluted them in their own gifts, in that they caused to pass through the fire all that opened at the womb that I might make them desolate, to the end that they might know that I am the Lord. End of quote. That's in Ezekiel 20. Now I suspect you're saying to yourself that you don't believe the Lord would ever lie to anyone. I agree. The Lord never personally lies directly to anyone. It's against his nature and it's against his eternal law. He uses Satan and other lying spirits to deceive people and hand them over to their delusions. Please read the following text from 1 Chronicles very carefully, and don't bother digging out your inspired version because this is the inspired version. Quote, And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the hosts of heaven, standing by him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall on Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this matter, manner, and another said on that manner, And there came forth a spirit, and stood before the Lord, and said, I'll persuade him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? And he said, I'll go forth, and I'll, I will be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And he said, Thou shalt persuade him, and prevail also. Go forth and do so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of all these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil concerning thee. End of quote. That's in 1 Kings 22. You can see the exact same account in 2 Chronicles 18. God can and does turn his apostate people over to Satan and lying spirit. He does send strong delusion. He does use lying spirits to answer people according to their idolatry in their hearts. As the Old Testament informs us, he creates both the good and the evil. He uses evil people as his pawns to accomplish his purposes. Nebuchadnezzar the king was an evil tyrant. However, the Lord refers to him as his servant, because the Lord used him to accomplish his purposes. Quote, and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I'll send and take Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and will set his throne upon these stones that I have hid, and he shall spread his royal pavilion over them. End of quote. That's Jeremiah 43. Before leaving this portion of the critique, let me briefly show you an amazing prophecy in Deuteronomy that's probably related to the prophecy Ezekiel was speaking of in chapter 14. More importantly, it is probably a prophecy about a great test that God puts the Latter-day Saints through. Please understand the following verses containing a prophecy of a future event that takes place in the latter days after God cuts off the nations of a land that Israel inhabits. Read chapter 12 for context. Quote, when the Lord thy God shall cut off the nations from before thee, 
whither thou goest to possess them, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their land. Take heed to thyself, that thou be not snared by following them, after that they be destroyed from before thee, and that thou inquire not after their gods, saying, How did these nations serve their gods? Even so will I do likewise. Thou shalt not do so unto the Lord thy God, for every abomination to the Lord which he hateth have they done unto their gods. For even their sons and their daughters they have burnt in the fire to their gods. What thing soever I command you, observe to do it. Thou shalt not add thereto, nor diminish from it. If there arise among you a prophet, or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after gods, which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken to the words of that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you, to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God, and fear him, and keep his commandments, and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him, and cleave unto him. And that prophet, or that dreamer of dreams, shall be put to death, because he hath spoken to turn you away from the Lord your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed you out of the house of bondage, to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God commanded thee to walk in. So shalt thou put the evil away from the midst of thee. That's Deuteronomy 12 and 13. As you can see, this prophecy is about to a great test that God's going to put his people through in the last days. He's going to have a true prophet lead these people astray that are not able to discern truth from error for themselves. The warning God gave to his people was, quote, Thou shalt not add thereto nor diminish from, end of quote, the word of God, even if his prophet tells you to. How ironic is it that the prevailing arm of fish, flesh teaching among God's people is that the, quote, prophet will let, never lead you astray, end of quote. There is no credible scriptural documentation for that false doctrine. As illustrated in Ezekiel 14 and Deuteronomy 12 and 13, God does use his prophets to test his people and lead his rebellious people into further darkness. Another incredible story about how God uses true prophets to test people by delivering false messages is contained in 1 Kings 13. When God's true prophet tells us to go contrary to the word of God, we are to not hearken to the words of that prophet, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. End of quote. Do you idolize Joseph Smith so much that you're going to believe anything that he taught without proving it against the holy and infallible word of God? If so, you've failed the test. Do you love the Lord more than Joseph Smith? If you worship God and love Him with all your heart, then you'll be able to stand firm in the Word of God and cast aside anything that adds to or diminishes from it, regardless of who introduces it. Even if it's our beloved Joseph Smith, even if Joseph was very convincing, even if he showed signs and wonders, even if Joseph gave parables about polygamy as signs of its truthfulness, even if Joseph produced wonders such as angel angels threatening to destroy him, and take away his free agency, etc. I feel that those who have searched the scriptures and have taken the Holy Spirit as their guide, and that believe the Book of Mormon, would acknowledge that the assumption and associated question upon which section 132 is predicated is a false premise. That's problematic. We would probably be justified in rejecting this revelation after the first verse, but I continued on evaluating this section anyway, because there's a lot at stake here. It would certainly be a grave mistake for me to reject this revelation if, in fact, it was a true revelation from God. However, I would be forced to reject several other revelations by accepting this one. Based on the myriad of doctrinal inconsistencies that I found in this revelation, I have no choice but to reject the other gospel that is taught in this revelation. I have decided to stay true to all of the passages in the four standard works that this revelation mocks. As with all the articles that I write, I encourage the reader to discount my own interpretations and to study for yourselves the scriptures presented above. May the Holy Spirit guide you as you discern truth from error.